Oh, yeah. All right, guys, let's go ahead and walk through here. Um, take 30 seconds right now, 30 seconds to choose who's going to say, share out their question for the class. That way I can kind of use it as an example, modify it. It'll actually help you out to hear your question reworded or revised if need be, or just say it's good so you can kind of see where you're at, whether or not you're on track. So 30 seconds right now, choose who's going to say their question or combine them into a maybe third separate question. All right, let's start in the back row here. Jack's team, what's your question? Shh. Share out a question. It's okay. It can be simple. It can be complex. I don't mind. What's our like? What are the different illusions in the Northern Renaissance art compared to the Italian? Okay, so what are the different illusions, like A L L or illusions, like I L L? Okay, both. <laughs> they are different. Do you know what an illusion is, like, um, like a historical illusion? Yeah, A L L. It's like a historical illusion. Like what you said? Uh, kind of. It's sort of like you're using a, a person from the past in a, you're referring to something or somebody from the past in order to create a meaning. So in some ways, uh, I think what you might be thinking of is allegory, something that has a double meaning. But they, Sure. Oh, right. So something that might be like you're using a term that's from the Greek era, but it has now a new meaning because you're using Exactly. So could you use, can you talk about historical illusion in, in Renaissance art in general? Has there been historical illusions? Have we seen the birth of Venus, for instance, in Botticelli's work? Yes. Now, the Northern Renaissance, I know we haven't seen too much yet. You've seen Jan van Eyck. Uh, we've seen some North Italian realists. But for the most part, you're gonna, you might want to consider how they allude to certain other older traditions. That might be fine. Now, if you were to use the word illusion, that would be fine as well. How do they develop illusion? That is, in their paintings, how do they make it appear like it's what? What would illusion mean at that point? Three-dimensional. Three How are we taking three-dimensional space and flattening it on a two-dimensional plane? That might also be something that you'd want to explore in the, North, uh, the Northern Renaissance. Northern Renaissance, once again, is a time period between about 1300 and 1600 that occurs up in the north. Flanders, Holland, uh, Germany, Saxony, these areas up in the north of Europe. So you'll start thinking and being aware of that if you haven't already read the chapter. What type of question is that? This idea of trying to identify illusions or illusions in works. What would you, what would you uh, have said is a type of question? Take a guess. You, you, you decide and you defend, basically. Okay, so if you were to compare and contrast it, I want you to... Put some, put some words in your question that force us to compare and contrast. It should be clear. So it would be, what kinds of words, what key words would you put into your question to make sure you know it's a compare and contrast? Okay. Yes, you could literally say compare and contrast two words that show historical illusion and how those works are different or something like that. You could also say things like, what are the differences between the Northern Renaissance and and the uh, late Renaissance in Italy regarding its historical illusions. What are they? What are they talking about? What is the subject matter going to be, and how are they similar, and how are they different? That's a great one. Thank you very much for speaking up. Um, we're gonna get some points, but yeah, go ahead and put plus five on your papers. All of you, all of you, for that.
guess what? I guess what? eventually everyone will get five points if they get some good stuff here. Yes, give me your question, Sam's team. Sorry, I'm sorry, they were talking. Um, can you please go again? <laughs> Say it one more time. How are religious narratives similar to secular narratives in the Renaissance? How are religious narratives similar to secular narratives in the Renaissance? And at that point, you can also pull from the North, you can also pull from the Italian. Uh, I like that one. What type of question is it? A compare and contrast. So you want to not just say compare, but you also want to say what are the what are the differences, or, or or look at the you look at you know these two different eras. So make sure you're splitting it up, not just the Renaissance, but make sure they know that they're comparing two different cultures. So modify that, and we'll be good. And put plus six on your paper uh, for being interrupted. Yes. What's your guys's question? Identify three artworks using oral prints. How does it change and affect art? Okay, and what type of question is that? Thematic. thematic. Now, why is it thematic? Because it's uh, using an overarching theme, uh, analyzing artworks. Okay, so overarching. What's your overarching theme then? What are you trying to get them to, to talk about? Oil paints. Okay, so you're using the theme of oil paints. That is the type of painting medium. And looking at that across a couple of different cultures, maybe, or in a particular one, and just looking at how they do it. Is that, is that requiring you to compare and contrast necessarily? No. No. So you don't have to compare and contrast if you're just com if you're just looking at theme. Very good. Thank you. Put plus five on your papers, each one of you. Uh, this team here, uh, Ben's group. How is the use of oil color changed from Italian to Northern Renaissance? So how is the oil color changed between the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance? Okay, good. Uh, what I would do with your question, just to, I know it's weird, but did a fl flip the uh, the two cultures because the Northern Renaissance comes before or after the High Renaissance in terms of using oil paints? It's actually before. If you notice, 1434, Jen Van Eyck is using oil paints. He's using them about a you know about 50, 60 years before Leonardo da Vinci. So just as a heads up. That I know it's weird because we're doing something called anachronism. We're actually going backward in time. Um, that we have we broke linearity of, of history because we're doing regional histories. So I went from I went from the Italian Gothic all the way through the Italian Renaissance, and now I'm saying, oh, let's get in our DeLoreans and get back in time. You guys know my reference or no? Does that not exist anymore for you guys? Yeah, yeah there you go. Back to Marty. We have to go back in time and learn about the Italian, yeah, the Gothic period in the, yeah. in the north. It's very important, northern renaissance. Okay, doesn't work. Okay. Something's got to be done with your kids, Marty. Okay, no. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah, yeah. yeah you need to use exact yeah. It's my favorite exactly, movie, but that's all right. Exactly yeah, I guess I've seen that before. Right. Do not make your own I saw, okay. I saw that too Thank you. Very good. Oh, very cool. So, going back in time to actually go to the north. So, thank you very much. Uh, oil paints, you were talking about oil paints, right? How they're different in the north is a pretty simple one. What type of question is this? Uh, comparing contrast and historical context. So you're going to talk about historical context. You're actually going to look at the beliefs and values of each of these people and how it might relate to the oil paints. Okay, so that would be a little bit more of a complex question than just a thematic use of oil. Because now you're bringing in beliefs and practices. So I want to be seeing those in your works. Good. Put plus five. Yes, this group. Okay, choose one to talk to share out. Is that going to bother you? All right, go quick, just with two of them. I won't speak as much. How does the use of oil colors uh, in religious art in the Northern Renaissance um, that exemplify daily life and identify two works? Okay, so identify two works that exemplify daily life in these two areas. Um, I missed the first part, sorry. The, uh, oil colors and... Um, with two media, with with a medium and a subject, so that's very complex. So you're saying, look, look for an oil paint that has religious works, and you're saying to look at them in those two different uh, exemplify that exemplify life. daily life. Yikes! Okay, so that's a, like now. How would you describe the type of question with that? 
Maybe it's thematic because that keyword daily life. We call daily life paintings, and it will be up in the north. It'll be called genre paintings. Genre. G-E-N-R-E. Painting. So when you see that, you'll know kind of what we're talking about. It's like daily life. And it does relate to historical context as well. It does talk about a, a, an attribution. You'll have a full attribution of your work, so that's good. Yeah. So that's a complex question, so there'll be overlapping types. Yes, Lorraine. Okay, so how is the impression of world color and religious northern Renaissance art used to convey meaning and differ from that of northern Italian Renaissance art? Okay, that's a long question as well. Right. So, Several different types, what would you say? So, um, from the three topics, which I was one and two, and from the types of questions, I was thinking it was uh, compare and contrast as well as a thematic and an attribution. Yeah. So you want to be careful, uh, and it's okay to actually... Uh, to do complex questions, but you want to start thinking about how close your question will start looking to an AP question. So these are good questions. They're actually a little bit over complex for what an AP test question would do, which is great for your purposes because you're trying to you're trying to challenge yourself. But it actually is actually an okay thing to just choose one type of question. See, can I identify how that question will look? And that way, I'm, I'm very quickly going to be able to answer the question when it comes on the AP test. So just to let you know, you're, 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 you might be overworking it, which is good for challenge, but might not always help you identify quickly a question on a test you might be thinking above the question. All right, uh, good. Put plus five on your paper, guys. That was excellent. Uh, this team here, what do you guys got? Good, so we got what type of question would you say that is? It's a compare and contrast, but you also throw in a little historical context, which is totally cool. You're talking about how it affects culture, so cultural values, beliefs, and practices. Will the Reformation, that is a break between the Catholic Church uh, in the South and the now Protestant movements in the North, will that affect culture and people's beliefs and practices? To not be Catholic anymore, would that be a, an influential thing? Yes or no? Yes. 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 That's a large division that's about to occur. Very good. Thank you. Put plus five on your paper. Perfect. You guys back here, Justin Steen. That's all right. All right. How has previous areas affected the way that the Renaissance will go? So how how are previous eras affected about how the Renaissance will go? Yeah. How is it like paved the way for? Oh, okay. So how how have had previous movements yeah. contributed to the Renaissance? That's how I would reword that so that I, I am able to understand the tasks of all. What kind of question is that? It's a challenging, right? So or it, so you're looking at art and transition, and you're seeing how previous movements, uh, in which you're taking from those movements, challenging them, changing them to make them new. So that would be a good example. So in your, your examples, you should have at least one from a previous movement and then one from the current movement. So you got to kind of look back on your previous packets. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Let's go ahead and uh, go back to your notes here real quick. You guys want to give me your plus five. I'm worried, though, because she's being kind of rigid. Yeah, I'll put plus five at this point. I guess. Plus four. I know what they're Mahima. Um, go ahead and turn, flip to your notes here so we can get started. If you had notes from yesterday, you'll just attach those to the back. That's fine. We left off with the Arnold Feeney portrait. Beatrice, can you turn off those lights so we can see it pretty well? Jen Van Eyck has produced kind of what I would consider to be a super themed work. There's a lot of overlapping themes within this work. Highly symbolic, perfect representation of the Marx model. You can find meaning in the work, you can find aesthetics, uh, a good strong aesthetic with representation and symbols. You can find cultural context to the work as well. Ultimately, you can talk about gender roles, you can talk about marriage, you can talk about daily life, you can talk about any type of cultural values in the work, you can talk about oil paints. Um, so there's a lot of things that go on with the Arnolfini. And chances are, if you know a lot about it or you think this is a work that you could remember easily, you should study it in depth. I can't study it in depth in class. You should study it in depth on your own. Use the gardeners, use the internet, read, watch a YouTube video on it, something. Chances are a free response question about theme will pop up. 
and the Arnolfini portrait might actually fulfill that requirement. So just consider yourself uh, sort of warned about that, that there are certain works like the Arnolfini portrait that you can use uh, to be successful on that free response question. In fact, I would suggest there's only about 15 or 20 works that you need to know super in depth if you know which ones to target so that you can apply them in many different ways. Now the challenge is applying a work that you might think of as one theme to another theme. One that you didn't think that it would fit, but you're like, actually it does when I read the question. I can actually fit this into a religious, something to do with a religious belief. Could I fit Arnolfini portrait into religious belief? Well, if I know enough about the Arnolfini portrait, I can, if I know it from all these different angles. So that's just something to consider. Now, maybe the Arnolfini portrait ultimately doesn't work well. You might know of a better work that fits the religious theme or something like that. I'm just giving an example of something that's the, the most farthest away from this work. I don't think this work has strong religious symbolism. There's no Jesus in the painting. But there are uh, several hints, including if I were to uh, zoom into this area here. I talked about the cool illusionism that was occurring inside of the concave, uh, concave mirror. That's his, we already showed you the signature. But on the outside here, this would be that subtle, what I was talking about, with religious theme. Uh, what is this depicting on the outside of this mirror here? Family this tree. Right. Oh, I know. Uh, it's, 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 it looks like it might be a family tree, but if you look very closely, he has produced in very small sort of detailed ways, life of Jesus. literally the life of Jesus. It's the life and passion of Jesus. So it's a religious mirror. So this religious mirror is small. It's sort of a luxury item, much like we did back in the Hiberno-Saxon era. So we have, um, in the north, there'll be less of an emphasis on large-scale religious works. The frescoing of Italy it stays in Italy. Okay, so Gothic period, we had in the French Gothic, it was all about stained glass and flamboyant tracery. In the South, it's about frescoes and canyante and beautiful platonic, you know, naked people everywhere. In the North, it'll be more simplistic. It'll, their churches will be whitewashed with triptychs, maybe it's sort of a gen generic Gothic style or pulpit areas. Their paintings will be subtle. Maybe characters sitting at tables with bowls of fruit. This is the northern sort of style of paintings, a little bit more subdued in its content. Subdued. It's a good word. Yes? In the Baron's book, it says that it was traditionally assumed to be a wedding portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his yeah. wife, but some scholars now say that it's uh, possibly a, uh, a memorial to a deceased was. Oh, interesting. Wife. So there's at least a few different theories about what this work was produced for. And, and, and that's something that you would not want to bring up too much because you want to focus on the artwork itself. But that might be important for the background to choose one of those two theories and go with it for the way you analyze it. So, so that's actually a good point because if the test is talking about you know, cultural values, you don't want to talk about, well, some, some scholars think this, some scholars think this. Just, just tell me what you think it is at that point. Say this work was produced potentially as a, you know, a memorial to the wife, if that's what you think is interesting from your studies. Very good. Uh, this is also, I, I mentioned how Jen Van Eyck, Botticelli, some of these other guys, they're actually cheating a little bit. They produce work, you know, Parmigian Nino is another example. They, they take these high polished mirrors, these convex mirrors, and they can point them at certain things, and they can kind of create a proto mirror, something that'll actually, a proto projector, I should say, like almost like a lens. It takes an image and shoots it out in a way that they're able to trace proper proportions. And so this is going to be something that the North invents for uh, the South to use. So someone like Da Vinci is actually going to be, um, he's going to be beholden to someone like Jan van Eyck and others, like uh, at the time period that are creating and using this early form of projection. So that's an important innovation that you need to be aware of. Eventually this will become the camera obscura, and Da Vinci helps model this as well. It's basically a big box where you have that mirror, that really tiny lens, just like an eye, and then it projects a silhouette or some other type of image on the back wall for you to paint on. And it's scientific. It's the use of the sciences in order to produce the work. And so you can see a little bit of how that innovation occurs and what's being done here. What are the similarities and differences, though? Because we're still in the 1400s. We're not in the full high renaissance yet. We haven't, we haven't completely broken away from Gothic tradition 
or Gothic ideals in, in terms of human figuring and gesturing. What are some similarities between these two works? We'll start there and then the differences. We'll start with Ashley and then Justin. They both have those stretched, kind of tight facial features. The stretched, tight facial features. I actually don't know a term for that. If someone can find that or look that up, that there is a, such a thing. Because it does seem like the Gothic period, they always have these sort of stretched, uh, smooth, porcelain-like skin in it. If you, uh, There's a description of that somewhere. I would love to know it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's that kind of pulled back skin. It's idealized in a way where the characters feel very porcelain and flat. And you see the similar thing here up in the, up in the north with Jan Van Eyck in work here, similar to the, the international Gothic style. Uh, what what else is similar about the works, Justin? Uh, the, well, a couple of things. The tilted head, the, the eyes are looking in the same direction. The, the, she has a hood on, but the other girl has a cock. It's kind of similar, though. They have, like, a covering that goes on them, so it's just sort of a female um, kind of covering. It makes it seem like she's in a particular role or place. Good. What else? Those delicate, sort of elegant hands that are in similar placing locations on the uh, body. A little bit different place, because I don't know if you've noticed the, the nip slip in uh, this work or not. Jesus? No, actually, it's, yeah, it's right there. Maybe? She's actually, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's her, yeah. So she's actually burying her breast. It's a typical thing that happens in the Gothic period with Mary. We don't look at a ton of paintings with that. That's a foot. No, it's no. Oh, you're right. No, it is a foot. <laughs> oh my god! I totally. Do you know how I saw it like this? Yeah. Oh my god! I got this video. Please. Oh my! See the nipples, guys. Oh my god! That was so like weird. It does you see even it? like no. it doesn't look like a foot now. It really does. Look, 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 look. No, I know. That was not good at all. Right? That was so inappropriate. Oh my god. I'm like, check out that nipple. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I don't know, guys. I'm just thinking about. Uh, I, I ain't that mean. That just just projecting that. everywhere. I, I, I didn't even see that. Oh my gosh. It looks like that's my eyes. I didn't see these old little toes. Oh my god. So, so you know, you see the toes and you see that. The, 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 oh. All right. Wow. Why are so I know it's stupid. I don't get Ow. it. I was, I was speaking off the cup. I shouldn't do that. I'm like, I didn't see it. No, but, but seriously. Sir, what do you mean you say what? No, you're gonna upload this. this. You're gonna be, you were gonna say that for like a couple other years. No. Exactly. Yeah, I'm gonna always forget it. I'm gonna always forget and then do it again. Um, no, but like I'm serious though. Like the, the bearing of the breast is a typical thing that Mary does. It's like one breast and it's like, oh, breastfeeding is to the mother of God and the mother of life. Let's go. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. That's great. Moving on, Cass, I'm going to ruin your, uh, your description. Yes, there's elegant hands. <laughs> uh, what, what, is now, what is different about the work? So let's, let's move in that direction. That makes it easier. So there's definitely, well, actually, they both are covered completely. So that's a similarity. But yeah, some differences. Beatrice. Um, the necks are different. How, how so? Because the one on the left, it's like where it goes. Yeah, so we got this sort of long, almost Gumby-like neck where it doesn't quite have the anatomical features. Certainly flattened in terms of shading in this work. It seems to rest a little bit more realistically. What else? Um, I noticed the one on the right has a necklace on it. Okay, so necklace of different types of jewelry. This is more secular, perhaps, in this work that's feeling a little bit more spiritualized. Yes? So one of the unfounds. Sorry, Finale Wedding has a higher QR spiral to it than the one on the left. Okay, so higher chiaroscuro, the Arnold Freeney portrait is a compo uh, compared to this, where it seems to be characters are in general flattened, and that just has to do with the dark darts here and where they're placed so that our shading is correct. Very good. What else? Yes? Um, on the right, it's like her face. Okay, there, there's a, a, a greater sense to her form, whereas this character here, there's elements of form because the shading is subtle, but. Ultimately, the character has a flattened quality to her face, as opposed to that, that same kind of face in three dimensions, giving it that greater sense of form, anatomical form, that makes more sense. So even though there's some gothic features, 
she's trying to be placed, it's like taking that gothic features and trying to make it more uh, of a realism in our shading. So, so the realism is kind of the kind of taking over right now. Lorraine and then Beatrice, finish it up. Um, the one on the left, uh, Mary and the baby have nemesis, and they like there was a whole like Byzantine on. Okay, so that that clear stylization from spiritual perspective, so the nimbus very clear one, Beatrice. Um, well, Mary, she seems idolized because of who she is. Like, yeah. People in Long Eden that they would consider like, kind of beautiful. So Good. I would think that that's what would make make her like that because she is like. Right. I want you guys to consider when you do a compare and contrast. The, the principles of design. So think about balance, think about symmetry. So, so it doesn't have to always be just like which ones are different, like which specific, like, uh, you know, those, those uh, when you're in your coloring books, it was like, you know, big differences, like which, which has the airplane in the sky and which doesn't, you know what I'm talking about? Like which ones are different. It doesn't have to be quite that literal. Uh, it can also just be how are the, you can compare and contrast all sorts of paintings that are very different as long as you talk about the principles of design, because that's what binds all artwork together. Talk about balance. Talk about uh, color contrast. Talk about uh, composition and emphasis and movement, because paintings that have completely different subject matter can be used for that purpose as well. Now, modern theorists, again, have claimed that Jen Benite's realism was literally done with mirrors. So this is a picture of that from a great book that you can actually uh, get on the AP site or on my, on my website, the Dropbox. It's called... Uh, the Secret Lives of Artists. It's a PDF. You want to, if you're interested in some weird sort of stories about each of these artists uh, and their, their secret lives that they led, uh, that's a great book to use. It might help you remember some of the artists and their personalities. People actually at the time did not like the fact that Jan van Eyck was cheating. It felt like cheating to not do it from scratch or from your mind. But mo modern artists today do use projections. So if you think of all your favorite artists that create posters or these kinds of things, they're all using projectors. So if you ever got to the place where you're like, I don't like to trace anymore, that's cheating. Well, once you get into the business of it, that's what you're doing all the time is tracing. You're cheating because you're going fast and you're making it look right. Now you know everything, how to do it from, from observation, but you're doing it quickly because you're trying to make something look good. And you know what your shading and all that kind of stuff needs to be as well. So he's placing those convex mirrors on purpose, and that's part of his uh, structure here in the Arnolfini portrait. Uh, oh, okay, so this is an illuminated manuscript called The Romance of the Rose. This is the story that goes with it. Not very, not very important work, but just to know that the illuminated manuscript tradition is still going strong in the north, just as it had been always in the past. Uh, this this uh, particular one has all this sort of over sort of romantic language to it. The idea of uh, flower of the day, the dawning of uh, what what she knows, the beautiful flower blooming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a little bit uh, sexualized, perhaps. I don't know, but uh, the work itself, the using a limited manuscript, taking it into a secular context to use poetry. Etc. So this linear perspective, that, or excuse me, this linear drawing style is, uh, in which lines are used and, and tracery is still going strong in the era. And other types of work now that are interesting to, to consider. I actually showed this in context of a reading we did yesterday in English 10, my world literature class. Uh, we, we actually took a descent into hell. And uh, in, in Dante's Inferno, there's this whole scene in which all these characters are, are forgotten by God because they didn't choose him in, the, uh, in life, and they didn't do anything really bad in their life either. So they're just sort of forgotten in the first level of hell. And so there's this whole depiction of hell from the context of the Middle Ages here from a character like this. His name is Paranamus Bosch. His name just uh, sounds sexualized to I me. Mean, this whole day has been weird. We're like nipples and all this weird stuff. I don't know. Anyways. Her name, is, her name is Bosch, is a uh, German, he's sort of from the Saxony region, and he's producing works that are very, kind of weirdly, strangely sexualized as well. Taking, this is called the Garden of Earthly Delights. And there's a lot of theory and speculation with this work, but it, produ but it shows <coughs> some of the weird emphases of the northern painters uh, within this time period. Uh, Bosch has a very specific style, but that style will, will kind of be similar to many of the other artists in the, up in the north. Uh, the, the far away pan of the picture, the perspective itself showing 
um, a full scene as opposed to just single people. Jen Van Eyck's big into portraiture. He's going to be uh, different than the rest of what I'm talking about. But, but landscapes and people just doing regular stuff. So you might see regular landscapes with houses and people running in the streets and playing games and, and all that kind of stuff, showing everyday life. That's going to be an interesting style. But for Bosch, he takes that same kind of everyday life landscape and then turns it into this sort of fantastical landscape, this fantasy landscape that is also connected to spirituality. So we'll go through it in a second. Yes? When, uh, I mean, where was this made? Uh, this is, uh, was produced in, in, in and near Germany, although I could be wrong. It's like the Saxony region. I think it's German. Um, but the work currently resides in, the, in Madrid. Um, which I've seen in person, it's really weird. Now, notice it's a triptych, so it'd be almost something that you would see in church. But this isn't something that you would see in your local church today. It's kind of a weird subject matter. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyways, that's a different one. So I thought I had to zoom in on this. Um, this would be a, a fun work to sort of zoom in on and to look at. Uh, I don't know if I have time to do that, but if I had to do the first panel here, the first panel shows the most... The most clear um, subject matter here in the Garden of what? Eden. The Garden of Eden. So the Garden of Earthly Delights has something to do with Eden. Jesus is in the center of the two uh, uh, naked beginnings of humanity. Notice that there are there are all these strange creatures, both real and fake and fantasy, that are coming out of this pit. It's almost like the, the place in which all of mankind and all things are coming out of the creative pit. And this earthly delights here have these strange, weird, like this is a giraffe, but it has very weird features here. You can tell that Bosch might not have ever seen a giraffe in person, these kinds of things. There's a unicorn, that's a fun one. Uh, there's an elephant to the work. Um, going all the way back here, a fantasy landscape, high bright colors here, uh, mostly greens, uh, and, and some el interesting surrealist kind of shapes here like that look biomorphic. Uh, this all feels very biomorphic as well, like it's a light, living structure. The word biomorphic is a great word to, to describe things that kind of look like life, but are just sort of lifelike shapes and colors. So like personifying. Almost like personifying, but think about just what, it's, what, what, what shapes kind of make you feel like it's living, something that's alive. Uh, round shapes, linear objects, negative space, uh, reds and, and, and tans. These are colors that tend to kind of give you a sense of something that might be biomorphic. And so this is a good sense of biomorphic. It's a structure. It's like a fountain, but it also looks like a strange creature. Now, there's, the theory is then that uh, in the Garden of Earthly Delights or Garden of, of Delights, you actually get the sense of um, that everyone should have been uh, able to do whatever they want in the Garden of Earthly Delights as long as they didn't sin against God. So that means they can just kind of explore themselves and explore their surroundings. And so one theory is that this area here, this triptych, would be if no one sinned, if Adam and Eve did not eat of the fruit of the, of the tree of good and evil, uh, they would have continued on this sort of great innocence that includes all these sorts of strange practices and, and, and activities. There's people sort of floating and dancing and jumping around. There was al there's almost an interaction of there's a highly sexual interaction of everyone going. There's one of my favorite parts here. I don't know if you see this here. Do you see this right here? This this person is literally sticking flowers in this other guy's. I see it. Oh. 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 Now wait, what's this? I I don't know, but if you, if you notice this, this is this is very fun. So so find the butt butt flower in your own. Okay, it's very fun. A little button, okay. A little Valentine's Day gift, guys. That's the one to give. <laughs> anyway, I don't know, but it's really weird and strange. Uh, other biomorphic objects, large, weird, sparrow-like flowers. Uh, everyone's been a great time. Wonderful work to look at. So the theory then goes that once this happens, um, the contrast to that is is that you have the carnal delights that get destroyed. And everyone's sort of in, in hell doing things that are similar to the innocence, but now we're doing it because there's a wrong balance or some other type of sin going on. So all these instruments, literally instruments of torture now, they're like violins and stuff, but people are being played on them. Those same animals now are like torturous demons. And you have the characters at the top, it's broken and egg, kind of weird characters. Very, very uh, disturbing in its, in its content, and iconography, that's right. Um, 
So that's one theory. The other theory is that this represents all of Earth and people doing things that they're not supposed to, and therefore there is uh, there's consequences. Before you guys leave, because I know you're cleaning up right now, uh, if you go to tcmorris.us, I have a new website that gives you a link to uh, everything that we do in class. Uh, so there's this site here. I've been I've been piloting it for a little bit. If you if you notice here, it has a link to your stuff, and then also my last. I have, I have, I'm trying to be very consistent with this the daily uh, the daily lecture, so you can use that to your advantage to help you out or to review things, or you can click on the link and get the PowerPoints. Hey guys, make sure that you get done with your speak outs by next Monday. This thematic unit will be Friday, and then I want to actually have you guys peer edit your speak outs on Monday. So that's kind of your breakdown of the week. Try and get your stuff done before next Wednesday, since that's when you guys are packing. TCMorris.us. I'll send a reminder out as well about it in case you're interested. Um, yeah, have I not collected yet? Collect your, uh, yes, yes I did. Turn in your packets from last week if you didn't already do so.